Well, thank you very much for inviting me to join this august group. I'm J. Patrick O'Leary, and I'm the token surgeon <laughs> who actually holds control of weight <laughs> in my hands. We are entering uncharted ground in the early 1950s. I probably chose the topic for today inappropriately um, because we should have focused on the end result of bariatric intervention, but it might help all of us to sort of see how it got started so we can understand where we are currently today. Surgeons entering into the care of obese patients were clearly in uncharted territory. Why would a surgeon be involved with treating a disease of gluttony and sloth and lack of willpower? They must be charlatans. It's interesting that this feeling was not only for the patients who were obese, seriously obese, morbidly obese, but those of us who were involved in the care of these patients became somehow less professional than our colleagues who are treating ulcer disease with vagotomy and gastrectomy, which has ultimately proved to be a very ineffective way to treat ulcer disease. The story began in 1954 when John Lanier, John is here now as a very mature man, and I talked to John about uh, three weeks ago. He is now 94 years of age and lives in Minnesota. John had the good fortune to land on the beach at Normandy, and subsequently, about nine months later, to land on the beach at Iwo Jima in the first wave in both. After his tour with the Army, he went to the University of Minnesota and was assigned to the laboratory with, under a man named Verka. And what he did is he was evaluating the proximal and distal inte uh, intestine, presented uh, at the American Surgical and published in the Annals of Surgery in 54. As an anecdote, at the end of this discussion was presented a patient in whom an operation to control obesity had been performed. It was uh, a jejunal ileal bypass. The ileum was four inches in length. The ileocecal valve was left in place. And this was the jejunum, and the patient lost remarkable amounts of weight. This procedure was revised uh, about three years when the patient gained weight. The patient's myocardial status improved. She died about 30 years later at age 61 of a myocardial event. In the presentation of that paper, the discussion was opened by Philip Sonboom, and he described a Hendrickson surgeon in Sweden who had done a number of these procedures. Three were mentioned in whom weight loss ensued, but there was a difficult metabolic problem in these patients. And that was the prodrome of the various complications that followed jejunal ileal bypass. Ten patients were done, performed um, by um, Payne, DeWind, and Cummings. This was reported in 1967. <coughs> They did a detailed examination of these patients. They evaluated them psychologically to start with. And then they planned, after they produced the weight loss, to reoperate on these patients and reestablish normal continuity of the GI tract. One patient died at six months of a pulmonary embolism. This was on Christmas Eve. An autopsy confirmed the presence of the PE. This patient had lost a considerable amount of weight and was um, um, without complications. They documented fatty liver, as pointed out by Robert earlier, normal kidneys by biopsy, and the intestine was normal. Um, they did all of these various tests, and they demonstrated a profound improvement in glucose metabolism. This was published in the 60s. The detail about it, this, I, I, if you go back and read this original article, it is wonderful how detailed the evaluation of these patients really was. Payne was a surgeon, DeWin was a gastroenterologist, and Cummings was a pathologist. They subsequently reported 
a much larger number of patients in the American Journal of Surgery in 1969. In those patients, they detailed the metabolic changes that were occurring in these patients. They also suggested there were changes in the liver. So we already documented that there was fatty liver in these patients from the serious obesity that they had, but it seemed that there was progression. We ultimately know now that the excluded limb of intestine, which did not have food running through it, but which was nurtured by blood supply, there was atrophy of the enterocytes, there was gap junctions created, absorption of toxic products of the overgrowth of bacteria in the lumen damaged the liver, caused an increase in metalloproteinases, and those patients, some, went on to develop cirrhosis. The details of how that developed was worked out actually in our laboratory. We also know that those patients developed kidney stones, and in studying that, we determined that oxalate absorption was increased in patients who had shunting of the gastrointestinal tract because the oxalate in the lumen of the bowel did not have calcium to chelate with because of the steatorrhea. And so oxalate went, made it into the colon and without much problem was absorbed across the colon mucosa. So kidney stones and liver failure were identified and were elucidated in further research. Gastric bypass for obesity was, was uh, proposed in the late 1960s by this man, Ed Mason. Dr. Mason uh, was at the University of Iowa. His first publication was with Chick Ito, but he then went on to publish a number of other papers through the early 70s. It was interesting that only three papers were published about gastric bypass, and those were all out of the University of Iowa prior to 1976. They proposed first that there be a division of the stomach and a side-to-side uh, -side anastomosis to the small bowel, the jejunum. This produced weight loss and then weight regain. They substituted uh, a smaller anastomosis that produced weight loss and then weight regain. They then made the pouch much smaller and again limited the outflow track in 75. And it was at that point in time that uh, this procedure began to, ca to catch on. It was modified by a guy named John Alden, that's the correct name, Alden, and uh, by doing a roux in Y, in other words, a, not a loop anymore, but an extension of one piece of bowel up and an anastomosis. And that is basically the way gastric bypass is done currently. Food is ingested, it goes into the small pouch, and then it goes into the jejunum, bypassing the distal stomach and bypassing the duodenum. Now, it may well be that the duodenum is critical in the patients who have improvement of their diabetes. A man named Walter Pores in the late 80s showed that there was clearly an improvement in glucose metabolism in patients who had this procedure. That was also published in 1982 by our group, which showed that with jejunal ileal bypass, again, the duodenum in continuity, showed marked improvement in both IV and PO glucose tolerance testing. Uh, at about that time, Mason, this is in the mid-70s, and um, contacted a group of colleagues, and my senior partner was a man named Woodward. He asked Dr. Woodward to come to Iowa and meet with a bunch of like-minded individuals to talk about how bariatric surgery should develop. Dr. Woodward could not attend and asked me to go in his place. I don't think Dr. Woodward was all that interested in going to Iowa or meeting with Dr. Mason or anything else. Um, seven surgeons actually attended this. There were a number of anecdotal presentations I remember having dinner at Mason's house and having cocktails on a lawn that needed mowing. Um, we agreed to have another meeting the following year, and this was all the antecedent to the American Society of Bariatric Surgery, and now what is called the American Society of Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery. Follows a loose list of people who were there that I can determine. Um, Ed was obviously there in Ken Prenton. Uh, Boyd Terry from uh, Missouri, Jim Thomas from Florida, uh, Lawrence Wilkinson from uh, 
Phoenix, Arizona, John Alden, we mentioned earlier, and several others who I cannot, I cannot remember. Um, the interesting thing about this is that was the NIDAS that created what is now an organization of about 5,000 people. It met last year and attending were in Atlanta. It was a 30th anniversary and in attendance at that meeting were 5,000 people. Uh, about 2,800 of those people were surgeons. As an anecdote, I woke up this morning about three o'clock in the morning. And remember we talked about the prejudice and about how difficult it was for us who are bariatric surgeons to get anything published, to get anything on a program. I went over the 30, 27 members who were president of that organization. There's only one who has ever been chairman of a major department. So the prejudice about in among the surgical community about people who are interested in this kind of studies still exists. And with that, Dr. Gold, I'd like to conclude my comments and I'd be happy to answer questions in the audience later. Steve, you've got time to go for it. No, no. I'm st I, I, I know, I'm, I told you I'd be done in 10 minutes, <laughs> but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Well, there, that's a great question. The synopsis of the whole thing is bariatric surgery produces about an 80% cure rate of diabetes within the first year after the operation. And there is some recidivism, but it's small and it occurs at about five to 10 years later. Follow up in these patients has been very good, Mark. And, um, and so many of these studies have now 15, 18 year follow up. The Swedish study that was mentioned by, uh, I think it was Sam earlier, um, um, did not have standardized operative intervention. The diabetes does improve. Um, weight loss uh, is substantial, 60% excess body weight over the first year. And there's some recidivism, more with gastric banding than it is with gastric bypass. And the sleeve resection does a substantially uh, same as gastric bypass, and it decreases ghrelin, which we, was mentioned by Robert earlier. So we don't know exactly how it works, but we do know that the, the weight loss is substantial, the diabetes is cured, um, and the um, lipids, hypertension, to a lesser degree, are substantially improved. So it does work. The complication rate is now about 2% doing the laparoscopic procedures, and that's the real answer to your question. Instead of open, do them laparoscopically. And the operative mortality is now down to 0.0 two in a tremendous sized study, that's two patients out of a thousand. And these patients are all high risk because they're seriously obese and they have all the other comorbidities. Thank you. Thank you.